Galatians 2.16. It says, Yet, because we know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we ourselves have believed in Christ Jesus. This was so that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no human being will be justified. Let's pray. Lord, we set aside our pride. We set aside our self-righteousness. Lord, we set aside our shortcomings. And we rely and we depend on the finished and perfect work of Christ. May we walk in freedom and with a pure heart in obedience to your word. May our Holy Spirit, may your Holy Spirit prepare us for this message that you have for us through the mouth of Pastor Jeff. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Kyle. Appreciate that. If you have your Bible, you can open to Romans 3. We'll be in verses 21 through 24. We're continuing with our series today, The Reign of Grace. Uh, today's message, as you may have guessed, is God's righteousness is now revealed. So Paul t started this entire train of thought, and we started that train of thought about eight or nine weeks ago, and we spent the better part of eight or nine weeks kind of looking at his main thesis, what he's really been saying about the human race from 118 to 320, and it just turns out that our situation is just about as bleak as you can imagine. The human race is lost in idolatry and atheism, denying God's existence and worshiping things that are not worthy of our worship. We have become self-gods. We worship ourselves. And we, beca we have become immoral idolaters living openly, proudly, parading our evil and our wickedness down the middle of the street. And we become self-appointed moralists, standing in condemnation of all of those depraved people out there, holding up abortion signs and rainbow flags, which ironically, if you recall, was the symbol of God's judgment upon the world. It was his symbol actually to promise that he would never again give us an extinction level event and that he would instead show us grace. And how ironic that the symbol has now become uh, sort of representative of the very kinds of evil and with wickedness that he judged the world for. I mean, that's an irony. But then Paul, as soon as he mentions 118 through 32, the kind of immorality and sin and self-worship that's just disgusting, it's revolting, he turns to the good moralist and says, and you're a hypocrite. You're just as sinful, and you don't even know it, because you stand condemned before a holy God also. And then he anticipates his Jewish countrymen, he, he anticipates their response, yeah, yeah, that's right. But he anticipates their response, and he turns to them in 2.17 through 3.20 to say, and you with the Torah, with the law, you try to live by it, you really can't, and then you preach it to others, and you yourself are guilty of breaking it on every level. And it turns out, he says in verse 9, chapter 3, verse 9, as we looked at last week, it turns out, he says, we have already charged and made the case that both Jew and Gentile alike are held under the dominion of sin, under the power of sin. For no one is righteous, not even one. And the only thing the law could do for you is to reveal to you that you are a sinner who has fallen short of the glory of God. Powerful, depressing, and just sort of demoralizing, isn't it? This is our helpless estate. But then Paul turns sharply to the remedy. He turns sharply and tells us the greatest news that we could possibly hear in our sins. And that is that God has revealed his righteousness and that his righteousness can be received in Christ freely by grace. Verse 21, he says, but now apart from the works of the law. The righteousness of God has been revealed, attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, since there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and they are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in 
Christ Jesus. You can follow along with me today, track with my message with this uh, very simple outline in your bulletin. Just joking. He starts the passage out by saying, but now. But now is one of Paul's favorite phrases. He uses it 14 times in his epistles, in his letters. And the phrase is intended to communicate. It's a line of demarcation. He's saying that was then, and that's what characterized our lives then. But now, God has done something about our dilemma. He says, but now, having been set free from slavery to sin and becoming a bondservant to God, chapter 6, verse 22. He says, but now, having been released from the law, the confines of the law, we have died to that which bound us, being released to serve in the new way of the Spirit rather than the old way of the letter. Chapter 7, verse 6. That's his theme verse for chapter 7. He says, but now you who were once far off, you Gentiles who were once far off from the people of God and the covenants of God have been brought near by Christ's blood. Ephesians 2, 13. He says, but now you have been reconciled through the physical body of Christ, which we're going to celebrate at the end of the service today, Colossians 1, Paul loves this phrase because it, it has to do with the former epoch. The former era is over for you. The, the new era has begun. The new epoch of grace is upon us. And so God has intervened into our hopeless and impossible situation, our depressing and demoralizing situation today, being lost in sin because he has revealed his righteousness in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. And he's going to tell us what that righteousness is. Before we get to his explanation of it, I want to give you a little bit of systematic theology this morning. Are you up for that? Oh, good. (laughs) I'm glad to hear that. We're going to talk about what God's righteousness is today. What is the righteousness that is being revealed in the gospel? What does the gospel reveal? First thing you need to know is that righteousness, God's righteousness, is the quality or characteristic of being in the right. That's a definition. This characteristic of being in the right biblically encompasses essentially three aspects. We're going to look at them in point one today, okay? So it's the quality or the characteristic of being in the right, And so the first way that we want to talk about God being in the right is that just that, God's state of being. We talk about righteousness, the first thing we have to think about is God. The Old Testament word for righteousness is the word sadak, and it's translated in the New Testament as the word dikaiosune, or dikaios, and that word can be translated as righteous or in the right or just. You'll see that in the passages that we mentioned today. So God's status by nature is such that he, by nature, is in the right, which means however God is, is the right way to be. That's what's right. Jesus told his disciples, listen, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. God is infinite in all his moral perfections, and as such, he stands always in the right. Look at how Moses described him in Deuteronomy 32, 3 and 4. And I put some other passages down. You can look those up too. They say pretty much the same thing. He says, oh, praise the greatness of our God. He is the rock. It's not Dwayne Johnson. It's God is the rock. His works are perfect and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is he. You will often find in the Old Testament the word just and upright in the same sentence when it comes to God or people. So God is as to his very nature. His essential nature is that he's upright, he's just, he's right. Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6, watch this. This It's one of the greatest passages in the whole Old Testament. Memorize it, put it in your back pocket. Here's what he says. Look, the days are coming when I will raise up a righteous branch for David, and he will reign wisely as king and administrate justice and righteousness in the land. So this is a son of David. This is the Messiah, right? And in his days, Judah will be saved. This is a really interesting passage. Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell in securely. This is the name that he will be called. This is his name. The Lord is our righteousness. 
So the Messiah's very name is going to be the Lord, Yahweh, is our righteousness. He is our righteousness. So when we think of righteousness, we must first think of God. Because God himself is great. God is perfect. God is just. He is faithful. He is upright. In him there is not even a shadow, not a hint of turning, of wrongdoing, or darkness. His very being provides the foundation for all that is righteous. So God has by nature the quality or the characteristic of being in the right. The second way we think of righteousness is our standard of conduct that comes to us in the form of moral laws. Our standard of conduct as moral law. So God has issued us. We do not by nature stand in the right, do we? What we've been learning over the last eight or nine weeks is that actually we stand in the wrong. We stand unjustified before God. And so because we do not stand in the right, God issues us moral decrees for us to follow. And these come through as moral law to us. Deuteronomy 6.25, this is just how Moses defined this. He said, and if we are careful to obey all his laws, all this law, before the Lord our God, as he has commanded us, that will be our righteousness. So how does he define the Jews' righteousness? To obey every single law you have ever heard, Moses say, good luck. Ezekiel 33, 13. Now, that is a fascinating passage, man. Please, just mark that. Go home, read it. This passage is great. But here's what he says here. This is God speaking through Ezekiel. He says, when I tell the righteous person, the so-called righteous person, that he will surely live, but then he trusts in his own righteousness and acts unjustly. What is he saying here? This so-called righteous person is saying, I'm a righteous person, and then he acts according to his own way. He calls that righteousness, but in fact, he is acting in a way that is not righteous at all. He is calling good evil and evil good, which is what our culture is doing today. And then none of his righteousness will be remembered before me then, and he will die because of the injustice he has committed. So understand now that God's essential state of being is that he stands by nature in the right. And when God issues us moral obligations and decrees that come through to us as laws, that constitutes our moral duty to one another. And that's what's right. The last way in which we think of the word righteousness is God's just sentence, which determines our status or our standing. This is God's just sentence upon the sinner or the righteous person, which will determine now our eternal status and our standing in his court. Okay, so God's righteousness also encompasses the idea of a verdict that he issues on the world. And that verdict either results in acquittal, vindication, salvation, or your damnation, your condemnation. The opposite of being in the right is being in the wrong, and that brings condemnation. And so if we stand in the right, we are declared what Paul refers to as justified which is essentially the same word as the word righteous in the text. They're essentially the same word. He's just using it in a different way. Psalm 98, 9, he says, For he comes to judge the earth. He, God, will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. So this very idea of God being the judge of our eternal status, of our eternal destinies, permeates the Scriptures, Old and New Testament. You can't get away from it. You certainly can't get away from it when it comes to Paul. Why do I bring this up? Because there are pastors who are teaching today, guys like Greg Boyd. I'll just call him out. He's a brother in the Lord. Love Greg. He's a little kooky. But he essentially is just trying to erase this idea from Scripture that God is a just judge who will hold us accountable. You can't even read the book of Romans if you erase that idea from the scriptures. Yes, it is true that God is love. And the reason why he has great mercy and great love and great compassion on us is because he stands as our judge. And he has determined that if we follow the path of sin and that's what characterizes our life in the end, we will be judged unrighteous and will be lost forever. Romans 2.13, he says, for the hearers of the law are not righteous. The hearers are the folks who attend synagogue in the Sabbath before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. So the first thing we must understand about righteousness is this. It is a standard of legal perfection. 
grounded in God's own perfect nature, God's righteousness, and it is a standard to which we are held and by which we will be judged. We must understand this is what Paul means now when he says, when he uses the word dikaiosune. And so when he says the dikaiosune theu, the righteousness of God, he means God's righteousness. Next, God's righteousness, number two, is apart from the works of the law. Praise God. <laughs> I mean, we've been singing about that all morning. That last song we did, the whole gospel is in that song. The whole sermon is. It's apart from the works of the law. He says, but now, now, apart from the works of the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed. So this righteousness that we've been talking about is now revealed in the gospel. The works of the law here refers to the moral standards, the ethical codes that God has issued to us in either Moses' or the moral law written in the heart. But we learn in verse 20 that the law can only reveal what the standard is. The law can tell you what the standard is, but the law can't help you meet it. How will you? So works of the law refers to their belief, uh, the Jewish belief, in the grace of legalism. Have you ever heard this term? The grace of legalism? It describes what the Jew believed in the first century. This is, that is, they believed that they were saved by grace. They were saved by virtue of the fact that they were born into Abraham. Who else was born into Abraham? They were. Who else was raised in Torah culture, going to synagogue on the Sabbath, hearing it read to them? They were. That is a grace to them. And so they believed that they had been saved by grace, but that they kept themselves in the covenant by works. By works. And so there are... Um, Theologians today writing lots of commentaries. Most of the commentaries that you would buy, buy on Amazon.com want to point this out. These theologians, they're called the New Perspective Theologians. The New Perspective on Paul has attempted to import this understanding of the Jews into the Christian faith. That is to say, in, into Paul's theology. And the thinking is, Paul held that view as a Jew, so clearly that's what he's describing here as a Christian, Right? Saved by grace, kept by works. Is that what Paul is describing? Did Paul import his Jewish theology into his Christian understanding? So I want to say three things about that. I bring this up because if you go on Amazon right now, like I said, and you try to buy a commentary on the New Testament, this perspective is probably going to be in there. And so I want to bring some correction to this because this is not what Paul is saying. Okay, he is not. Paul does not reflect this view of his Jewish countrymen. He is refuting it. Paul is not commending it, he's critiquing it. This is the very view in the text that he's bringing correction to. The second thing I want to say about that is, look, legalism by any other name is still legalism. The new perspective theologians on Paul, what they're trying to do, what these scholars and commentators are trying to do is they're trying to save Judaism, and I think rightly so, at least in this part. They're kind of trying to save it from the abstract or a kind of abstract uh, Pelagian legalism that didn't really characterize the Hebraic religion. Scholars like E.P. Sanders and James uh, D.G. Dunn, N.T. Wright, Richard Hayes, Scott McKnight, pushed back hard on this idea that the Jew was just a legalist. And they say, that, that's just a silly parody of Judaism. That's just a silly caricature of Judaism. The Jew believed they were saved by grace, and so they hold that the reformers held this view, that the Jews were just these bean-counting legalists who tried to earn their way to heaven. Nonsense, they say. Judaism has little in common with this view of legalism. Paul's Jewish contemporaries believed that they were saved by grace and kept by covenantal faithfulness to the covenant. They had a high view of the law. And so they call this covenantal nomism, but it's still just covenantal legalism, actually. I want to be very clear about this. I'm going to put this up on the screen. Any belief that by my works I can either earn God's favor, placing me in his good graces, or that I can maintain that favor by works is still a legalistic work uh, of salvation. It's still a legalistic view of my salvation. If I think that by my works, God puts me in the covenant, or I think that by my works, God maintains me in the covenant, that is still legalism by any other name. A rose is still a rose, right? 
So let me say very clearly, if your Christian theology is essentially not distinguishable from first century covenantal Judaic covenant legalism, then you're in the wrong camp. You're not in Paul's column. It's not a view he's reflecting. It's a view he is refuting. It's a view he is trying to bring correction to because now, unlike then, now God has revealed his righteousness, a righteousness that is not according to works, the works of the law, but is according to faith in Christ Jesus. Third thing I want to say about that is both the Gospels and Paul recount lots of instances of Jewish legalism. I'll just point out three. These are super fun, and they're everywhere in the Gospels. Do you remember the story that Jesus tells? It's a parable. And in that parable, what Jesus says is this. There are two Jews, two Torah-observant Jews. Both of them come to the temple to offer their sacrifices, which as a Jew, you're supposed to do in Yom Kippur. You're supposed to offer your sacrifice so that you can be covered, atoned for, right? Isn't that the purpose of it? And so they are both there to practice Torah. And one of the Jews, a Pharisee, Jesus describes him as a person who is full of his own self-righteousness. And the self-righteous, legalistic Pharisee stands before God. Now, they both know they're sons of Abraham, right? They both are there observing Torah law to give their sacrifices right. But what he says is that that Pharisee believes that his self-righteousness makes him better than the other guy. And so he bellows at close range, bellows on and on. Oh, I thank you, Father in heaven, that I am not like that guy. Right? And then Jesus says, and the sinner, the publican, the Jew who was there to do his moral duty before God in the sacrificial system tears his shirt, like tears his robe and cries out for mercy and grace and forgiveness. And then he asks this all-important question, which one of those two men went home justified before God. Paul didn't invent the doctrine of justification by faith. Jesus did. He said, which one of those two went home in the right before the court of God? And everybody knows the answer. It's the man who confessed his sins and cried out to God for mercy and forgiveness and grace. Another example is the rich young synagogue ruler. The rich synagogue ruler comes to Jesus. This guy's, in terms of Torah obedience, this guy's about as tight as it gets. He's a synagogue ruler. He's wealthy, and in that culture, they taught a kind of false prosperity gospel uh, that if you were wealthy, God, that's evidence that God was blessing your life, and if you were poor, that's evidence that God's curse was upon your life. So he's wealthy. He's a synagogue ruler. He comes to Jesus, and he's Torah observant. He's pious. He's as pious as a human being can be, and he comes to Jesus, and what does he ask? Master, good teacher. He's very respectful. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, the question that he's asking there is not the same question you're asking. He's not asking, what can I do uh, to inherit heaven when I die? He's asking a Jewish question. Lord, what must I do to inherit eternal life when your kingdom breaks into the world? When your kingdom comes and, you, comes and your will is done on earth as it is in heaven, that's a Jewish question, right? So he's asking the question, what must I do to inherit the everlasting life that comes with this new kingdom that's breaking into the world? And what is Jesus' response? He doesn't give him the answer. He doesn't tell him. He says, go obey Moses. You've heard that, right? And the guy goes, uh, well, I've been doing that. I mean, I've been doing that since I was knee-high to a grasshopper. I've kept the law as meticulously as I know how. Surely that can't be the answer. Indeed, that's not the answer. And Jesus says, okay, you want to know the answer? And he still doesn't give him the answer. He just gives him access to the answer. What he says is, okay, here's your problem. Uh, you, your God is your money and your possessions. That's between you and your God. That's become your new God. Go sell all that. Give the proceeds to the poor. Donate it to charity, and then come follow me. Be my disciple, and then I'll lead you to the answer. And he goes away sad because he cannot accept that answer. What is the young man's problem? What is the rich ruler's problem? He has practiced moral perfection according to the Moses of law his entire life, and he's worried, he's anxious that there might be one more thing that he's left off the list. That's legalism. That's a Jew who believes he was born into Abraham, been given the grace of Moses, but then thinks that he is keeping himself in the covenant by his works of righteousness. That's legalism. 
And then Paul himself, in Romans chapter 4, Paul literally uses the term wages to contrast grace. He says in verse 4, now to the one who works, that is works of the law, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. Nobody pays you your paycheck because they're like, oh, here's a, here's a, here's a gift this year. No, they're giving you something. They're remunerating you for work done. Verse 5, he says, however, to the one who does not work but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. It couldn't be clear. He thinks that works according to the law, a righteousness according to the law, is trying to earn your salvation. And he thinks that receiving the free gift and the free offer of grace is not that. Romans 6.23, he says, for the wages of sin and death is sin and death, but the gift of God, the free gift of God, is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Listen, here's what I want to say. Don't blame the reformers. Don't blame the evangelical Christians because we see this idea of earning people's salvation, people trying to earn their salvation. It wasn't just made up by the reformers. It's in the Bible. Jews believe this. They thought that they would keep themselves in God's good graces by the works of the law. But now, a righteousness from God has been revealed apart from the works of the law by faith in Christ. God's righteousness is also, number three, attested by the Old Testament. It's attested by the law and the prophets. So while God's righteousness now is not from works of the law, It is also anticipated and foretold by the works of the law and the prophets, thereby upholding the purpose for which the law was given. Paul will literally ask this question in Galatians 3. He asks the question, why then the law? Like, why was it given? He says in verse 20 that it was given to reveal sin, to reveal God's standard, and we have broken it. The law was also given to halt the human race rushing headlong into moral oblivion. Galatians 3.19, he says, why then the law? It was given because of the increase of transgressions to stop us from rushing into moral oblivion before Jesus came. The law was given to drive us into the arms of grace. Listen, if the law reveals God's standard and also tells you that it has no power to help you meet that standard, that will drive you into the arms of God's grace. But the saving righteousness of God that has now been revealed, which is anticipated by Moses and anticipated by the prophets, it's now revealed in Christ Jesus, could never come to full fruition in Moses' covenant. It just couldn't. There had to be a new covenant of Christ's blood and his flesh broken for us. So while righteousness is not according to the works of the law, it is attested by the law. The law and the prophets point forward to righteousness, the righteousness of God in Christ. Fourthly, God's righteousness is through faith in Jesus the Messiah. God's righteousness is through faith in Jesus the Messiah. He says the righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe since there is no distinction, that is, between Jew and Gentile. For all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. So he says faith in Jesus Christ. Now typically in the New Testament, that usually means something like trusting reception. It means to trust the message that you've heard and to receive it with open and empty hands. So I want to point out a few things that the New Testament teaches about the nature of faith. First of all, faith is belief. Faith is belief. Now, it's not an accident and it's not a mere redundancy that he says the righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus to all who believe. That sounds like a redundancy, maybe a mistake. Maybe he shouldn't have said it that way. But understand, he's trying to define it. He's trying to tell you what faith is. Faith is belief. To all who believe, both Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned, both Jew and Gentile. Now, at first, we might think that's a redundancy, but understand, in Romans chapter 10, this is exactly what he calls our attention to. Verses 9 and 10, he says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. That's the Christian confession. And believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. So Paul defines it in chapter 3, verse 22, as belief, and Paul defines belief in chapter 10 as an internal agreement. It is a person who has come to a settled belief, a settled conviction in the heart that this is true. Do you remember the day you got saved? 
Do you remember the day you came to the Lord? I remember the day I came to the Lord, and on that day, here's what I thought. Man, the gospel is true. And in my heart, I just knew this, is the tr- this message is true. And I, in my heart, I came to a settled conviction over the matter. But then that settled conviction deep in my heart bubbled up by the Holy Spirit and my confession, this must be true. This is the truth. So faith is belief. Faith is also obedience. Faith is obedience. Romans chapter 1, he says, we apostles have been called, sent to the Gentiles to call them to the obedience of faith. He says it again in Romans chapter 16. He refers to faith as an act of obedience. Why is this important? Because understand, unbelief is disobedience. Not believing in the message of Jesus when it is preached is an act of disobedience. And believing in the message that of Jesus when it is preached is an act of obedience. And this is why he calls it the obedience of faith. Next, faith is also a gift. Faith is a gift. So God not only gives us his son, his one and only son, as his gift to save us, he grants us the very faculties that we need and the opportunities that we need to believe on the son. Philippians 1, 29, it's one of my favorite verses. He says, for it has been granted to you, Philippians, on Christ's behalf, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. The word granted there is just the word graced. You have been given the opportunity to believe on him. It is God who gives us the opportunity to believe on Christ. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, he says it more clearly, even more specifically. He says, for you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift. In other words, your salvation is not your gift to God. It's God's gift to you. So God gives me three things. God, as a human being, God gives me the capacity to trust. That is one of the, one of the things that makes, uh, that defines what a human being is, a capacity to believe in that which I only have some evidence for. So he gives me the capacity for belief. He also gives me the opportunity. Listen, I didn't choose to be born in the Bible Belt in the South and hear the gospel on Sunday morning and and sin literally all weekend until Sunday morning and go to church with mama and get saved again and hear the gospel. I didn't choose that. God is the one who gave me. He's the one who decided the times and the places in which I would live to hear the gospel. So he gives me the capacity as a human being to believe. He gives me the opportunity. He puts me in the very times and places where I need to be in order to hear the message, but then he also gives me the very faculty, the mental and spiritual faculty that I need to believe. He is the one by the Holy Spirit who turns on the light of the darkened mind in sin. He is the one who by the Holy Spirit sets the prisoner to sin free to believe. So this salvation, saved by grace through faith, is not of myself. It is a gift that is given me from God. Faith is a gift. The faith also must have the right object. He said it's faith in Jesus Christ. He doesn't just say faith. I love this question. Are you a person of faith? Do you ever use that on anybody, by the way? I use it all the time. I think it's just a great door opener. I think it's a great discussion Opener, but here's where I'm going. I want to know, do you have faith in Jesus? And not just any Jesus. The Jesus of this book. The Jesus of history. What is the message of Jesus? Who is he? Colossians 2.9 kind of sums it up. Colossians 2.9 says, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, has tabernacled, tabernacled, taken up residence in a human life, All the fullness of the deity, whatever God is, has taken up residence, has come to tabernacle in a human life, Jesus of Nazareth. John tells us that he was the Logos, John chapter 1, verse 1. John tells us that he was the Logos, the Word, from eternity past, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and that everything that has been made was made through him. And then in Philippians chapter 2, tells us that Jesus, who was in very nature God, who did not consider equality with God something he needed to grasp, 
or hold on to, but instead poured himself into the form of a human being, a servant, and then a slave, and then a crucified man in obedience to the Father. And so if, listen, if you don't have that Jesus, you just have the wrong Jesus, and your faith is totally worthless. But there are a lot of people in the United States, and I've met many of these people who just believe in my fairy God Jesus who gives me a miracle a day and prosperity to keep all my troubles away. And that's a false Jesus. There's no such thing as the magical Jesus. Or how about the Jesus who is just the greatest of all prophets? Well, Islam teaches this. They have actually, uh, relatively speaking, they ever have a very high view of Jesus, but it's not high enough. Jesus is the greatest prophet who has ever lived. Yeah, but he's more than that. That's true, but he's more than that. He's the son of God and God the son. If you don't have that Jesus, you got the wrong Jesus. Or how about the LDS faith? I had a conversation with two young men who came to my door a couple of weeks ago, and they wanted to talk about Jesus. And so for the next three and a half hours, <laughs> uh, I explained to them how quite literally everything they believe is wrong. And, they, and at the end of it, they said, Sir, can we please go... <laughs> You've never heard a Mormon missionary say that to you, right? I said, yes, yeah, sure, go ahead, go. But one of the things that I keyed on is the fact that Jesus is not Lucifer's spirit brother. He is not one of many gods. He is the word from eternity past who was with God and was God in the beginning. And if you don't believe in that Jesus, doesn't matter how much you talk about faith, your faith is worthless. See, the faith that counts that God credits to our account as righteousness is the faith in Jesus, God's one and only Son. And so faith must have the right object. Fifthly, God's righteousness is a free gift of grace. It's a free gift of grace. Therefore, it just can't be something that you earn. It can't be something that you are trying to live up to. It can't be something that God is going to give you as a reward for a righteous life lived. It can't be that because it is a free gift of grace. He says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are justified freely by his grace through, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Don't misread that verse. It's conditional. Here's what I mean. When he says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that's everyone. But when he says in verse 24, all, they, the all, are justified freely by his grace through the redemption of, uh, that, that is in Christ Jesus, he's not teaching universalism. Some try to use this passage as that. It's trying to say, well, Jesus is just teaching, uh, Paul is just teaching here this kind of universalist faith. L listen, if all means you've sinned, then verse 24 must be applied to all people. No, because in the rest of the context, read the context. It's those who by faith have received Jesus, as we just read. So we've already mentioned that grace is a free gift, the opposite of earning or maintaining one's salvation by works of the law. And salvation by works, understanding, understand this, is transactional. It's an earning reward system. But salvation by grace is relational. It's a trusting reception system. It's receiving with empty and open hands, bringing nothing literally to the table. It's receiving the free offer of God's love and his reconciliation in Jesus Christ. And so the illustration that I've always given my children, I want to give it to you today, is uh, when I was a little boy, about seven or eight years old, we had moved from California, from Southern California, and the, the most exciting ride that I had ever rode uh, was the Dumbo ride at Disneyland. And I just thought, that's the most boring thing I've ever done. You see kids and their little Mickey Mouse. I have, literally have a picture of me in a Mickey Mouse hat. I am three years old, I am on the Dumbo ride, right? And I am screaming my head off. And it's not because I don't want to get off. It's because I want to get off. Like, I want to go ride the, the real rides. So I had always dreamed of doing that, and I would see them in the distance and know, that's not for me. And then we moved to Virginia. And there's this massive uh, Hanna-Barbera park there. I think it's owned by Paramount Studios now called King's Dominion. And I uh, went to King's Dominion every year, a couple times a year. Sometimes we got a season pass, and King's Dominion is this huge Hanna-Barbera park. So when you go in, you don't see, like, Mickey Mouse and stuff like that or uh, Goofy. You see uh, Fred Flintstone, Grape Ape. Remember Grape Ape? He was my favorite, Grape Ape. 
And so you go into King's Dominion, this beautiful theme park, and I was seven years old now, just about to turn eight, and I walk into this theme park, and there are all these roller coasters everywhere, and I know I'm going to get to ride all of them. And so we step up to this roller coaster called the Galaxy. It was the first one. And it had these bulb lights, these old-fashioned bulb lights, and it was flashing the galaxy, the galaxy. And we waited there in line for like an hour, just my tracks, tennis shoes melting to the hot pavement. And then we finally get all the way down. It's me, my brother, and my dad. And we get all the way down to the end of the line, and there's a little Fred Flintstone character, and he's holding a ruler. You know what I'm talking about? And the caption above his head reads, what? Are you this tall? And I knew that was for me. And so I step up to the the ruler when we get up there, and I step up there, and I just kind of close my eyes. I get very zen about it. I start to think very tall thoughts. (laughs) Be tall enough, Jeff. You're good enough. You're tall enough. You are tall enough. And then I open my eyes, and the kid who was counting heads and uh, in, in charge of the ride said, sorry, kid. And I got these two big marble-sized tears in my eyes about to break over my eyelids. And then he felt bad for me. And he said, "Uh, hey, kid, is this your dad? And I said, yeah, that's my dad. And he said, well, since you're with your dad, you can come on in. And I got to ride the galaxy. And I wet myself on that ride. It was kind (laughs) of sort of ended our day. (laughs) What Paul says in in chapter 3, look at it again, verse 20. The law was given to reveal sin. The law is God's measuring rod. And it asks the question of you, are you this tall? Because here's the standard, do you meet it? And the answer is you don't. You don't meet it. And the rest of the bad news is the law can't possibly help you meet it. But then grace says, based on nothing more than a relationship with your heavenly Father, the God of the universe, through his Son, Jesus Christ, you can enter eternity with him. That's just what Paul is saying here. That's all he's saying. If you want to know God, if you want to be reconciled to God, if you want to enjoy eternity and life and his glory with him forever, it's through Jesus, and there just ain't no other way to get there, okay? Not through your works because you don't meet the standard. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you today that we do not have to trust in our own efforts or righteousness either to bring us into grace or to keep us in grace. God, you knew from eternity that we were not going to be a safe bet, that we could not possibly bet our lives, our on our righteousness, our ability to be acceptable before you. And so we thank you for sending the Messiah, the one whom Jeremiah prophesied would be our righteousness. And God, we thank you that there's nothing we have to do to earn your favor. There's no key to being approved by you. It's just trusting what Jesus has done for us on the cross, trusting in his blood, which is fully sufficient for our salvation And God, we trust in in you today. God, we choose to put our faith in you and what you have done. We choose to receive it with empty hands, the empty hands of faith. We choose choose to believe in our heart and to confess with our lips that Jesus Christ is Lord, Savior, and Lord to the glory of God the Father. And God, as human beings who have received this free grace, we want to live in the ample resources of grace the abundant and ample resources of this free gift that has been given to us. And we want our lives to conform to your word. And we want our lives to look like Jesus, to look like the grace and mercy of Jesus and the truth of Christ in the word. And we thank you that you've given us all these things. And if you're here this morning and and you haven't received Christ, would you do it now? It's just coming to a settled belief in your heart a settled conviction in your heart. Jesus died for me. Jesus gave his life for me. Jesus was resurrected from the dead so that I could be saved and be with God forever. Would you just make that conviction, that that confession today? 
And if you're here and you're a believer and you have made that confession, would you just trust the Lord and begin to live in the ample and abundant resources of his grace today? And let perfect love drive out all your fear. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.